Hello and welcome back to my physics lectures. Uh, this is a lecture that is meant for the general physics class in particular. Uh, this is the second lecture for that course and it's going to be delivered in two parts. Um, we're, we're talking about kinematics in 1D and today's lecture is going to be part one of this uh, subject which is basically getting familiar with what the terms are in kinematics and learning sort of what kinematics is and all that. And then in part two, I will look a little more in depth at motion in kinematics under a constant acceleration. So what is kinematics? Uh, to, to begin with. Well, it's basically the study or the description of motion. So uh, kinematics is sort of the first part of dynamics, which is the study of motion in general. And we're looking at how can we describe the motion of an object quantitatively, meaning describe it in such a way that we can fit numerical uh, data, numerical analysis to can we make a graph that shows this motion, can we set some equations to this motion, etc. Kinematics is not so much concerned with explaining why a thing moves, it, it's not really concerned with the efficient cause of motion, if you will, or the final cause of motion. It, it ignores such concepts as forces or impulse or energy, etc. All of those will be topics covered in future lectures, but for right now we're just interested in describing the form of the motion itself. So how does the motion evolve with time? What would the motion look like? Uh, both if you watched the actual object or if you sat back and looked at a, a graph of where the object is versus time or watched a video of the object's exact location as it moves. The key terms of kinematics are presented here. Um, basically, there are four vector terms that you really need to describe a motion. And there's three scalar terms that are particular to kinematics and, and a fourth one if you include the parameter time. So the, the vector terms include the position, the displacement, the velocity, and the acceleration. And they are vector terms because they have both a magnitude and a direction. A magnitude means how much or what is the size of this vector. The direction means can you point to where an object is, for example. Uh, there's also the scalar equivalence of these terms. Distance is a sort of scalar equivalent to something like the displacement. Uh, speed is like a scalar equivalent to velocity and in fact the magnitude of a velocity is going to be a speed and there's also an acceleration in both vector and in scalar. The acceleration is just telling how the velocity is changing if we're talking about vectors and it's telling how the speed is changing when we're talking about scalars. I want to look at each one of these terms in more depth. So let's start with the vector term for position. And position is basically the location of an object in space. It is specified with respect to some reference point, which is commonly called the origin. Uh, another way of looking at that is that the origin is usually determined based on where the reference point for this motion is. So it might be the point at which the motion begins. More often it might be the point at which some observer is actually located while watching the motion. It can be a commonly agreed upon point if there's multiple observers, for example. Consider a uh, motion within a room. 
you might specify the origin with respect to the corner of a room or one of the walls or the middle of the room, etc. So that, that then gives you an origin in all of the locations of the uh, that, that an object passes through during its motion will be specified with respect to that origin. The origin choice to some extent helps determine whether we're going to have a 1D motion, a 2D motion, or a 3D motion. Now there's other factors that are involved in in this determination. For example, if the acceleration is in a different direction, not parallel to the velocity, then we're not going to be able to describe the motion in purely 1D terms. But assuming that the velocity and the acceleration are along a common axis, then the motion can be determined within one, two, or three dimensions. And at this point, the only reason to go to more than one dimension might be that I'm trying to describe the motion from a position that requires more than 1D in order to describe that motion. In other words, I might choose for my origin to be the south wall of a room. And if that's the case, then I can specify the position of an object based solely on where it is with respect to that south wall. So if the object is three meters north of that south wall, then I might say that the position of the object is plus three meters. If it's th two meters south of that south wall, then I might say that the object's position is minus two meters and in that case actually the object is sitting in another room. If I wanted to specify this position in with respect to a particular corner of the room then my position is going to end up being in 2D. Basically one dimension tells me how far and in which direction I am from the south wall. The other one how far and in which direction from the west wall. So my origin then is the corner where the south wall and the west wall meet. So if I'm three meters north of that south wall and, and six meters east of the west wall, then my position might be six comma three. Usually you specify east west first and then north south second. If I want to get even more uh, particular, I might choose the location where both the west wall and the south wall meet with the floor of the room. And in this case, I now need three dimensions to specify an object's location. So I would use the point where how high is the object above the floor? How far from each wall is it? So usually you specify east-west, comma, north-south, comma, up-down. So if the object is two meters east of the west wall, three meters north of the south wall, and four meters above the ground, then I'd specify the direction as plus two, comma, plus three, comma, plus four, etc. And especially when we get into a 3D example, although I suppose you could say even in the case of a 2D example, objects start to be extended. And so you have to pick a particular point to represent where that object is located. So if we wanted to know where am I located within a room, we might specify the exact point that's in the middle of my whole body or at my center of mass. Or we might, for that matter, pick the point that's between my two eyes on my face because theoretically, if I'm holding a conversation with you, that's where you might be looking in engaging that conversation, unless you're a mathematician, in which case you might be looking at my feet or your feet or something. 
So the position can change for an object, and that's just what happens when an object is moving. And this change in position is what's called displacement. Position we often represent with an X with a little arrow over the top. The little arrow, by the way, just means it's a vector. Uh, if there's no arrow over the top, it usually just means it's a scalar that we're dealing with. Displacement is going to be defined by a change in position. So it's your final vector position minus your initial vector position. The little triangle signal is actually the Greek letter delta, and that represents change in. And for notational purposes, the triple bar again means defined by so it is equal to but it's a logical definition for the thing and I will usually use subscript I for initial although sometimes I'll use an O for original or a zero for at time zero and I will usually use an F for final so an X with a little arrow on top and an F subscript means this is the final position of the object. And for position and for displacement there is a common SI unit which is the meter. If you want to go into imperial system, imperial units, then maybe you use feet or miles. But in the SI system, it's kilometers or meters or centimeters. And in particular, we use MKS units, so that means meters. The displacement tells how far my final position is from my original position. And so that means that the magnitude has to have units of M meters. The direction, of course, is going to have units of either radians or degrees. Um, the direction in 1D often just incorporates the sign of the displacement. So going back to my example of where am I with respect to the wall, maybe I start off 4 meters north of the south wall and then I move to 5 meters north of the south wall. Then my displacement is plus 1 meter. If on the other hand I start at those 5 meters north of the south wall and I turn around and walk 2 meters towards the south wall then now my displacement might be negative 2 meters from 5 meters to 3 meters north. And my total displacement, of course, from where I started is negative one meter because I went from four meters north of the wall to five meters north of the wall back to three meters north of the wall. If we go to 2D or to 3D, that direction then becomes a single angle or two angles. So it basically represents the direction in which you'd have to point along with your finger if you're standing at the origin to get from uh, where a position is and for displacement you stand where the object started at and point towards where the object ended at and then measure the angle of the direction you're pointing with respect to your x and y axes which are your north and south walls and you can even point uh, in 3D with an angle of elevation and measure that angle as well. The uh, equivalent, by the way, to displacement when we're talking just plain old scalars is distance traveled. And so the SI unit for distance traveled is also meters. In this figure, I have actually a couple of things that I'm showing. Uh, this is so you can visualize what the position of a car is and ultimately we're going to visualize what the displacement of the car is with respect to time. So the picture in the lower left hand corner is you could take it to be a series of snapshots of a car. Maybe you have a camera that's set up beside a racetrack for example 
and you take a picture and the car has moved uh, maybe 20 more meters in 10 seconds and you take another picture and then after another 10 seconds you take another picture and so on. So the figure labeled A that's in the lower left is basically if you put all those pictures together where would you see the car located on that camera? So the car by the way is always starts off at point A it moves for 10 seconds, it gets to point B, it moves for 10 more seconds, it gets to point C, and so on. So the the path actually followed from by the car starts here, it moves to here, it moves back to here, then it moves back to here, then it moves back to here, and finally it moves back to here. So that's what the car is actually doing if you were to watch as a spectator, take snapshots with a camera or what have you. The second graph, the one that's on the lower right, shows this data organized as a plot of position versus time. So the red curve looks more or less sinusoidal. In fact, if I think if we were to continue this motion, you'd get a sine wave or a cosine wave that's been shifted a little bit from, from, from the origin. And basically what this is showing is we could try to fit a mathematical model to this data based on this graph. In other words, the, the position might equal some amplitude, maybe 50 meters is the amplitude, times the sine of some function of time maybe plus some phase to get it shifted a little bit to the, the right or a little bit to the left. And what I want to do is I'm going to look at this these two graphs in a little bit more detail and and consider them in the context of position and of displacement. So Let's start with actually displacement. And what I've done is I've taken that second graph and I have put in some green arrows to show the displacement of the car as a function of time from the car's original position. So this green horizontal dotted line basically represents the car's initial position at the 30 meter mark. The green arrows are just showing what is the total displacement from that initial position and you basically get that by measuring the length of those arrows and then looking at what direction they point at. So they always start at the green line and they stop where they hit the the next uh, displacement point. So at A we've, we're just starting out and the total displacement therefore is zero because we're at the original position of the car. At point B we've moved to the 50 meter mark and we've done that in 10 seconds so the total displacement at point B is from 30 to, to 50 meters is plus 20 meters and then by the time we hit point C we've come back to maybe 30 five meters and so the total displacement is a plus five meters so plus 20 meters looks like an arrow pointing up that has a length that is equivalent to 20 meters on this scale plus five meters the arrow is still pointing up now it's got more like a five meter length on this scale then at point D the car has actually moved back through the point that we've defined as our origin the origin point maybe is where the camera is set up to take pictures of this car's motion or is the point directly in line with it if it's set back from this track. And at this point the car has arrived at the position zero. So in other words it's right at the origin point. And that represents a displacement of minus 30 meters from where it started from. So that means that the arrow has a length of 30 meters and it's pointing straight down and so on. 
so this gives us a an idea of how the displacement from original position is changing with respect to time. There's another way that we can consider displacement and that is to consider displacement as a function of how much the car has actually displaced during each 10 second interval that we've taken a snapshot. So I'm representing this for the uh, using these blue arrows and these blue dotted lines. So the blue dotted line represents the position that the car was at at, a, at the beginning of each of these time intervals. So we've got 10 second time intervals. The first interval is from A to B. The car starts at 30 meters and it moves to 50 meters. So it's got a displacement over that interval of 20 meters. Then for the next 10 second interval, it started at 50 and ended at 35. So the total displacement for that interval is actually minus 15 meters. And so we get a blue arrow that's pointing down with a length of 15 meters on this scale. Then for the next interval, we go all the way to zero. So the displacement is minus 35. And the next interval, maybe another minus 35 and so on. We can even represent the car's actual position as a sort of displacement. In this case, it is the displacement from the origin. So even at point A, there is some initial displacement. And this is these, I guess you could call it magenta colored arrows. At point A, it's already displaced 30 meters plus 30 meters from the origin. At point B, the displacement is plus 50 meters from the origin. At point C, it's plus 35 or, uh, meters from the origin. Point D, there's zero displacement from the origin. Point E, we're starting to get negative displacement, so the arrows are pointing down for E and F. And so it's negative 35 and negative 50 meters. So now that we've talked a bit about position and displacement a bit, I want to talk about velocity and speed. And unfortunately, in everyday parlance, velocity and speed are used interchangeably. With that said, in physics, they actually have different meanings. So speed is tells you just how fast the object is moving. It's a scalar. It's just a number. The thing has a speed of 30 meters per second, or the speed has a the object has a speed of 30 miles per hour. So that is speed. The SI units for speed is distance divided by time is meters per second. So any other unit might need to be converted to meters per second before continuing. Velocity, on the other hand, tells us how fast the object is actually moving. That's the magnitude of velocity, but also the direction in which it's uh, moving in. <clears throat> so because velocity is a vector, we can express it in either Cartesian, which is basically x, y, z form, it tells us Vx, Vy, Vz, or Vx, Vy if we're looking in 2D. And it's easier to use this way if you want to solve for a 2D motion one dimension at a time. In other words, most algebraic solutions are going to use the Cartesian expression. There's also a polar expression the magnitude of which is just this v term and that tells you actually how fast the object's moving and then there's also a direction theta which way is it going and in 3d you in fact have a theta and then you can have a phi a second angle and the way that you convert from cartesian to polar and vice versa is the same as with any other vector, I'll actually have a whole separate lecture on uh, vectors in the future. So with that said, how do you define 
the the velocity and how do you define the speed well the velocity can be defined as an average by taking the displacement over an interval of time and dividing by the time interval so here is your definition for average velocity it's change in position per unit time or net displacement during a time interval divided by the duration of that time interval final position minus initial position divided by final time minus initial time another word about notation you'll notice that there's a bar and a vector sign over the V the little bar means it's an average the vector sign means it's a vector so this is the average vector velocity sometimes by the way I will use just the vector sign and then an AV or an AVG to represent average um, just be aware that different uh, people will have different notations for that um, the other thing is that this is averaged over time it's not an ensemble average what that means is that if you want to find the average velocity during a time interval you don't take all the different velocities that the thing has during that interval add them together and then divide by the number of velocities rather what you do is you take the final position you subtract the initial position and you divide by the time just like the the equations above shows so if you say for example I uh, and this is true for speed as well by the way uh, average speed is going to be distance over time so for example if you have a motion let's let's make it simple as to a speed and you are running from one end of a track to another and you run for the first half of this 100 meter distance at a speed of 5 meters per second and then you decide to slow to a walk and do the second half at 1 meter per second well how what will your average speed have been well it's not going to be 5 plus 1 divided by 2 rather you have to figure out you've traveled a hundred meters and you have to figure out how much time that hundred meters took so let me work this example out using sort of my pen and paper so in our example here we've decided that we are gonna go half of the motion that's 50 meters and we're gonna do that in at a speed of 5 meters per second and then we're gonna do another 50 meters and we're gonna do that at 1 meter per second so this first motion is going to take us a total of 50 meters divided by 5 meters per second gets us the time. So time is equal to distance traveled divided by speed. So that's going to be 50 meters over 5 meters per second and so that should be 10 seconds then we have the time for the second motion and that's 50 divided by 1 so time for the second motion is actually 50 seconds so the average velocity for this whole motion then is going to be given by total distance traveled which is a hundred meters 
divided by total time, which is 50 plus 10, so 60 seconds. How many times does 60 go into 100? Well, it's going to go in 1.6 six, etc., seven meters per second. So that gives us what is the actual average velocity. Notice that that's going to be considerably different than the result we'd get by adding five to one and dividing by two, which would be three meters per second. So we have to to do it this way or you end up getting stuff uh, incorrect. Okay, so now we have a quick example of what the average velocity or, or the average speed looks like. How do you get the instantaneous speed and instantaneous velocity? For that matter, what's the difference between instantaneous speed and average speed or between instantaneous velocity and average velocity? Well, the average takes place over some time interval, maybe for a second, maybe for 10 seconds, maybe an hour, maybe a day, whatever. The instantaneous quantity happens in a particular moment, a particular instant in time. In that instant when the camera took a snapshot of the car, how fast was the car going? In the moment when you look down at the speedometer in your car, what does the speedometer read? Speedometer is roughly a instantaneous speed. So instantaneous speed basically means speed at a particular instant. And the way that we determine it, one way is to basically say that it's the speed taken as an average over a very short time interval. So as this delta t approaches very, very, very short times, then the average speed is approximately an instantaneous speed. There's a more rigorous definition. The, the definition really is to take the limit of this equation as delta t approaches zero. But to use it practically, you end up having to use calculus and not just algebra. So I want to show a simple pictorial interpretation of both average and instantaneous velocities. And, and this graph to the right actually shows a little of both. So let's start with the average velocity. In the average velocity, what you do to, to calculate is you take the initial point and you f take the final point so the, the initial and final displacement, you draw a line between the two and you find the slope of that line. In other words, the initial velocity or the, the average velocity is the total displacement divided by time. Well, displacement here is the vertical axis. Time fits on the horizontal axis. So average velocity or average speed is delta x which is the the vertical axis divided by delta t which is the horizontal axis so to find an average velocity draw a, a straight line from one point to the next and find the slope of that point so all these blue lines are actually to find average velocities from start to whichever point we're interested in. Start to point B, start to point C, start to point D, etc. So example, what is the average velocity from point A to point B and what is it from point A to point F? Well, to answer that, we look at what these positions are and we look at how much time has elapsed. So at point A, it's at 30 meters. At point B, plus 50 meters. At point F, minus 50 meters. And the time is 10 seconds from A to B, 50 seconds from A 
to F. So let's go ahead and write down these different positions at each time. So point A was the point that was at 0 seconds and plus 30 meters. Point B was at 10 seconds and plus 50 meters. And then of course point C was at 50 seconds and minus 50 meters. Okay, so if we wanted to find what is the average velocity, something like this, we would do delta x over delta t. So <clears throat> from A to B, what we have is that the average velocity must be equal to 50 meters minus 30 meters over 10 seconds minus 0 seconds. So this average velocity is going to be 20 meters that's positive over 10 seconds and so that's 2 meters per second. So that's from A to B. So I'm going to move up here to get from B to C. So point uh, from, excuse me, let's do from A to C. So the average velocity is going to be now negative 50 meters minus 30 meters over 50 seconds minus 0 seconds. And so that's negative 80 meters per 50 seconds. So for that part of the motion, from start to stop, if you will, we have a speed of negative 1.6 meters per second. So that's to find the average velocity or the average speed. What if we want to find an instantaneous velocity or an instantaneous speed? Well, those would be represented more by these purple lines that I've drawn onto this graph. And what the purple lines basically represent is they're tangent lines to this curve. In other words, they are the line that you would get if you started by drawing a blue line from one point to another, and then you started moving the two points very close together along the curve. So B to C, let's say here's point B, here's point C, we move point B along the curve this way, we move point C along the curve this way until they're touching each other or almost touching each other, what would this purple line between B and C look like? Well that's going to be the tangent to the curve midway between B and C. And after this Basically, the process then is the same. You find the slope of that purple line and you've got the instantaneous velocity. Or you can get the slope of that purple line for instantaneous speed if you just care about the distance traveled. So for example, can we find what the instantaneous velocity is for the car after 10 seconds and can we find it after 15 seconds? Well, this 10 second point is actually relatively easy to get the instantaneous velocity for because it happens to be point B, the very top of this curve. And you can kind of imagine maybe you, instead of drawing from point B to point C or point B to point A, maybe you start moving A along the curve and you move C along the curve and just draw a line between the two. And as they are approaching point C, that line should look more or less flat. 
and so the slope of that line is zero. And what that means is that the instantaneous speed is zero right here, and, and therefore also the instantaneous velocity is zero at point B at 10 seconds. As for this other one, what about at 15 seconds? Now we're talking about this purple line right here that's about midway between B and C. And what we have to do is find a couple of points that are actually on this purple line and use those to get the slope. So it looks to me like this purple line goes through the point 10 seconds comma 60 meters and it looks to me like it goes through 20 seconds comma maybe 40 meters. In order to find the instantaneous velocity we take the slope between our two points. So point number one was 10 seconds and 60 meters and point number two was 20 seconds and 40 meters. So to get the instantaneous velocity we just take the slope of this line that passes through these two points so what we get is 40 meters minus 60 meters divided by 20 seconds minus 10 seconds and so that is going to be negative 20 meters divided by 10 seconds and so our instantaneous velocity is negative 2 meters per second. And of course we can combine a set of these graphs to get a 2D motion or a 3D motion. So maybe you'd have one dimension that is the north-south motion of the car one dimension that's the east-west motion of the car and so you could do this piecewise by repeating this process a few times. So this brings me to the topic of acceleration and acceleration can mean one of two things. It can be the scalar acceleration which is just whether the object speeds up or slows down it can also be the vector acceleration, which is a combination of whether the thing is speeding up or slowing down and whether its direction is changing or staying constant. So let's start with the scalar acceleration. Just is the object speeding up or slowing down? The scalar acceleration then is change in speed per unit time. So an average scalar acceleration is defined by change in speed divided by the duration of the interval of time during which that change in speed occurred. So initial, uh, final speed minus initial speed divided by the time at which this final speed was recorded minus the time at which the initial speed was recorded. So that is the scalar acceleration and, and and in fact you can get a negative number or a positive number for scalar acceleration because if the object is speeding up you will you will find a positive number and if the object is slowing down you will find a negative number for vector acceleration we also care about the direction in which it's moving and the direction in which it's moving even in one dimension matters quite a bit. It, it can be moving, for example, from left to right, which is a positive direction of motion, or it can be moving from right to left, which might be a, a negative motion, a negative direction of motion. And in any case, to get the average vector acceleration, you take the change in velocity and divide it by the duration of the time interval during which that velocity change occurred. So final velocity minus initial velocity divided by time at which the final velocity was recorded minus time at which the initial velocity was recorded. And 
I should add here before we're moving on that to get the instantaneous acceleration, you do pretty much the same thing as to get the instantaneous velocity, which is that you consider these motions over a very, very short time interval. So let's look at a quick set of graphs that sh sort of show what this motion might look like. Uh, maybe you call it a conceptual example, which is the, the trip that a person might take from home to the store. So in this trip from home to the store, what happens? Well, you start off at your home, you get in your car, you drive three kilometers to the store, you get to the store, you turn around, you drive three kilometers back. Now, assuming that we only care about time spent actually moving in the car, and again, assuming that the speed of this motion is actually constant, what might a graph look like for position versus time during this trip? Well, you start off at home, which we've just defined here as the origin. You start off at the origin and you drive to the store, which is three kilometers in 0.25 hours or 15 minutes. So, by the way, you can get what the speed was during this time because you went three kilometers in 15 minutes. So how many kilometers is that per minute? Well, it's 3 fifteenths or 0.2 kilometers per minute. Then you get to the store. Immediately you've turned around and are now heading back. In fact, it takes you another 0.25 hours. That's another 15 minutes to get those three kilometers. So your position versus time graph looks like this. You'll notice that I'm not showing what distance versus time looks like. I'll leave that as a conceptual example for the viewer or the reader to figure out. But let's look at the velocity versus time. So I just said that it was uh, 0.2 kilometers per minute. This one's actually showing kilometers per hour. So multiply 0.2 by 60. What do you get? You get 12. So on the way to the store, 12 kilometers per hour. You get to the store, there's this sudden instantaneous change in the velocity because now you're heading back home at negative 12 kilometers per hour. What might the acceleration versus time graph look like for this? Well, you're not accelerating here, so zero. There's a sudden acceleration here, so you might get a very large negative spike at 15 minutes and then you're not accelerating here so again zero and what does the speed versus time graph look like well at no point did your speed actually change just your velocity so the whole graph is a horizontal line at 12 kilometers per hour and by the way your scalar acceleration versus time therefore should look like a horizontal line at zero because you never changed speed the vector acceleration basically obeys many of the same rules as vector velocity. Uh, notationally, we can put it in Cartesian or polar, and in 3D we can put it in 3D Cartesian, or we could put it in cylindrical or spherical. And basically the AX part goes with the VX, goes with the change in horizontal position, the AY maybe goes with the VY, goes with the change in vertical position, etc. If the acceleration of a motion is actually uniform and non-zero, then it's possible, and I'm referring here to the vector acceleration, it's possible to choose an axis so that that acceleration is entirely along that axis. And especially if the velocity is also in the same direction or exactly 180 degrees opposite to the direction of that acceleration, what that does is it means that you now have a 1D motion. To approach acceleration uh, graphically, we can 
look by analogy at acceleration as we did with velocity, the difference being that acceleration is change in velocity per unit time, whereas velocity was change in position per unit time. So that means that we would want a velocity versus time graph, and then the acceleration obeys all the same rules on that graph as velocity obeyed in the position versus time graph. In other words, an instantaneous velocity was taken from the tangent line slope from position versus time. So an instantaneous acceleration is taken from the slope of the tangent line of velocity versus time. And the averages similarly take the slope of the line drawn from velocity at the original time to velocity at the final time if you want to get the average acceleration. In considering the vector acceleration, there's a set of rules that we can follow to, to determine what sign, even in one dimension, that vector acceleration needs to have. And what I've done here is I've created a table which shows the four basic scenarios that you can go through with a vector acceleration in 1D. And to determine the actual sign, you basically have to look at the sign that is given by the magnitude of the vector, which is, in other words, is the object speeding up, in which case the magnitude is positive, or is it slowing down, in which case the magnitude is negative. And you have to look at the sign for the direction. Is the object moving in a positive direction, in which case the direction has a positive sign? Is it moving in a negative direction? A negative sign. And what you do is to find the actual sign that goes with your vector for acceleration, it's equivalent to multiplying these two signs together. So this one right here is the case where the object is speeding up and moving in the positive direction. So if the object is speeding up and the object is moving in a positive direction, then you have a positive sign times a positive sign, the acceleration is positive. If the object is moving in the negative direction, however, and the object is speeding up, you have a positive sign times a negative sign, and so your total acceleration is negative. If you're moving in the positive direction and slowing down, you have a negative sign times a positive sign, you get a negative acceleration. However, if you have an object moving in the negative direction, you've got a negative sign, and it's slowing down, you have another negative sign. A negative times a negative gives you a positive. So the acceleration for this case is positive. So those are the four basic scenarios for a 1D motion. And again, in 2D, 3D, etc., you can basically divide each dimension into an axis and treat it as a series of 1D motions that are coupled. I wanted to say something more about the difference between a negative acceleration and a deceleration. So decelerating usually means just slowing down. Whereas negative acceleration is given by this chart that was on the previous slide. In other words, there's a negative acceleration if the car speeds uh, slows down while moving in the positive direction so car B is actually decelerating and it happens to also have a negative ex acceleration car A has a positive acceleration and is speeding up but cars C and D the the sign on the vector acceleration doesn't agree with the sign on the scalar acceleration. In other words, this car right here, car C, is moving in the negative direction and the acceleration is in the opposite direction. This is a positive acceleration because the acceleration's to the right, but the result is that this car is going to actually decelerate. So we have a positive acceleration which is causing a deceleration. And in car D, the car has a negative acceleration, 
but it's actually going to be speeding up because it's already moving in the negative direction. So in other words, deceleration is shown by B and by C, where the these two vectors are in opposite directions. Negative acceleration is shown by B and D, where the acceleration vector itself points from right to left. And I wanted to work through or look at a, a short conceptual example. And what the conceptual example looks like is this. Suppose you're in a dark room and you have a camera and what that camera does is it has a very long exposure time so you you click the camera it takes a picture the exposure time maybe is for 10 seconds 12 seconds whatever but because the room itself is dark you don't see anything on it unless there's a light then you attach a little flashing light to an object that flashes brightly one time each second or one time every two seconds or what have you and maybe this flash lasts for milliseconds or so in other words each flash is for all intents and purposes going to be recorded as a bright spot of light on the camera and it's going to give a instantaneous position so suppose you do that for three different motions let's assume that in all three cases the the flash happens once every second and in all three cases the object starts off on the left and moves to the right <clears throat> so case one case a we have a flash and then there's a second and there's a s another flash and then another second passes there's a third flash and this time we notice that this third flash is a little bit closer to the second one than the second one was to the first one and then there's yet another flash and this one's a little bit closer to that last flash in in position on the camera and then another flash and another flash they're getting closer together in distance but not in time what does that mean the object is doing well each of these flashes represents a second of time and yet the distance is getting shorter in that second for each consecutive second. That means it's traveling less far in this second than it was in the first second. So the second second is less far than the first and so on. And in order for that to happen the object has to be going more slowly in this second second than in the first second and so on. So that means that the object here is slowing down as it moves. Okay, consider this B. Well, each flash is a second apart, and each spot made on the camera is basically the same distance apart from the previous spot as it is from the next spot. So that means that the object is neither speeding up nor slowing down. So we have six flashes here the object is always slowing down there's six flashes here the objects always going the same speed there's five in part C I guess somebody didn't want to summon the devil with their diagram and in this one the object each flash gets a little bit farther from the last flash and so this object is speeding up as it goes so at this point what I want to do is look at a few actually worked out examples that are relatively short and sweet. Uh, for our first one, let's consider a car which is initially stopped at a stoplight. And you know maybe you're in the, the uh, taxi in this photo. He's sitting there swearing at the light. The light changes from red to green. And being the typical taxi driver, he slams the pedal down to the metal and rockets you forward. Um, he's doing this to save you time, I guess. And so what happens is that he goes from 0 to 60 miles per hour in 4.5 seconds. So this taxi driver's got a pretty souped up car. So what is 
this final speed in SI units and what is the average acceleration of the car during this motion? Okay, so initially we had stopped and that's the same as zero meters per second. And finally we have 60 miles per hour. And this occurred in 4.5 seconds. So delta T equals 4.5 seconds. So our first step is convert 60 miles per hour into meters per second. So 60 miles per one hour needs to go into meters per second. So let's go ahead and start off by converting those hours into seconds. So we need to have hours up here to cancel with the hours down here. So there's an hour, there's an hour, and there's 60 minutes in an hour, and another 60 seconds in a minute. So 3,600 seconds. I'm not going to write all that out for the sake of time. And then we also need to have a conversion from miles to meters. So how many meters are in a mile? Well we could do this by going from miles to uh, feet for example. So 5,280 feet is in one mile. And then from there, there's another 12 inches in one foot. There's another 2.54 centimeters in an inch. And last but not least, there's one meter in a hundred centimeters. So what we need here is to whip out a calculator and do this conversion rate. By the way, I'm going to go ahead and make this conversion of uh, miles to meters first. So I'm, that's multiplying these last four together. Uh, just because that gives us a nice shortcut for future times that you can write down if you want. So 5280 times 12 times 2.54. By the way, that's an exact conversion from centimeters to inches. And then we need to divide that by 100. And what we end up with is 1609.344. So there's that's, a, by the way, an exact conversion. Uh, as an approximation, maybe you could say uh, 1,610 or 1,609, depending on how many significant figures you want to retain. So go ahead and divide that by the 3,600 seconds, and then multiply by our original speed which was 60 miles per hour and it looks like the answer is 26.8 uh, meters per second. So assuming that this is two significant figures that means that the final speed is approximately 27 meters per second. Okay, so now what was the average acceleration during this time? Well, it is change in speed over time. And so that's 27 meters per second minus 0 meters per second divided by 4.5 seconds minus 0 seconds. So that's 27 meters per second divided by 4.5 seconds. And so this is 6.0 meters per second squared. 
So our units, by the way, for acceleration are meters per second squared. So I go ahead and put that conversion rate up here. One mile is approximately 1,609 meters, just in case you want to write it down. Um, so let's look at another example now. Suppose the car in this previous example hits another red light and has to come to a stop. Let's say that it's just cruising along at 60 miles per hour, which I imagine is a bit fast for a city, but who knows. Um, so the car's brakes in this in this uh, situation provide a constant acceleration of 3 meters per second squared. So we want to know how much time does the car need to come to a complete stop. So we've already found from the previous problem that 60 miles per hour is approximately equal to 27 meters per second. So that's, uh, that is the initial speed. The final speed, of course, is that this thing is coming to a stop. So that's zero meters per second. We don't know what the time interval is because that's what we're looking for and we're given that the acceleration is a steady 3.0 meters per second squared, that's deceleration. So what that means is that we have the average acceleration is equal to the acceleration at any point in time. So since the average acceleration is equal to change in speed per unit time, if we want to solve for the time, that means that we can rearrange the equation, basically multiply both sides by delta t, divide both sides by the average acceleration. What you end up with is something like this. And so that's going to be uh, 0 meters per second minus 27 meters per second divided by negative 3.0 meters per second squared. So the delta t, or the, the uh, time interval to stop, looks like negative 27 meters per second divided by negative 3 meters per second squared. And so that is 9 seconds. This brings me to my final example, which is that now we want to know, suppose that that we take this whole motion, car starting at that first stoplight to when the car is stopped at the second stoplight. Let's assume that maybe it cruises at 60 miles per hour for about 20 seconds between these two stoplights. We want to know what's the average acceleration of the car from the time that the driver first uh, mashed down the accelerator gas pedal at that first light to the time when he comes to a screeching halt at the second light. And this one's actually maybe the easiest one of these three examples and the reason why is that we actually don't need to go back to the whiteboard to solve this. Um, he started from a stop, so his initial speed is zero meters per second. He ended at a stop. His final speed is zero meters per second. So that means that there was no change in speed from start to stop of the motion. So the actual average acceleration of the car during this entire motion is zero meters per second squared. That basically concludes this first part of the lecture. Um, as a general rule, I will conclude these lectures by going to a slide or in some cases two slides worth of references uh, because I don't necessarily make all of the visuals that I use in these slides and so I want to give credit where it's due. Thanks for watching and I hope that you find this video helpful and I will have a second part in which we 
look at the uh, motion of an object under the influence of constant acceleration in my next uh, set of lectures, which is basically part two of this lecture, if you will. So thanks for watching.